Good day guys, Shannon from Auburn Aquariums here. Today we're just going to be talking about something a little different other than aquariums. We're going to be talking about invertebrate pets. Now, what I mean by invertebrate pets, I mean spiders, scorpions and centipedes. Now, I know they might not be everyone's choice for a pet, but once you get past the fact that it's a spider or a scorpion, they're actually very easy to keep, very low maintenance pets. So I'm just going to show you a few from my personal collection at home and explain their basic care. So we'll get straight into that guys. So first of all, I guess the most common one around are tarantulas. Or in Australia they're called bird eating spiders. Now what I've got here is a Cynolodicus plumax. So I've had this one for about three years now. Now these tarantulas live for about 20 to 30 years depending on the species. So they live quite a long time. Only the females, so the males live between five and seven years. The male's only purpose is to grow up fast, mature, and mate, and then die. Where the females live for a very long time and they can breed every year. So they're the ones obviously doing the reproducing, therefore they live the longest. Basic care for these guys is quite easy. I mean, this is just a Tupperware container. Might seem small, but in actual fact with these invertebrates, smaller enclosures they're happier in. Um, they just feel more secure in a smaller enclosure. You put a bird eating spider or scorpion in a large tank, it's going to hide, you're never going to see it. Put it in a small enclosure, it's out all the time. Especially because the Tupperware containers have got kind of... the sides aren't fully see-through, they're a bit hazy. So the spider feels like it's almost in a burrow chamber, so it actually comes out and displays all the time. My tarantulas never really hide. So the basic care is for these guys, you have some coconut fiber. I found that's the best substrate for all invertebrates, just coconut fiber. Because it's absorbent, it holds moisture well. Um, it's very cheap, so you can replace it all the time quite easily. So for these guys, you want to have a deep substrate. You can go even deeper than this, like this is almost 10 centimeters. You can go 20 centimeters if your enclosure is tall enough, but you guys do like to burrow. Um, so the main issue with tarantulas is humidity. Um, these guys like the enclosure to be slightly humid and moist. So the, you know what the substrate to be dripping. If you can squeeze the substrate in your hand as hard as you can, and water drips out, that's too much water. You want it just to be slightly damp, and you want a bit of humidity. These guys like it around 20, between 25 and 30 degrees. So if you're living in an area where it's quite cold, you might look at getting a heat mat for it, but with heat mats or heat cords, a lot of people go wrong, they put the heat mat under the tank. You don't want to do that. Instinctively, these spiders burrow down to escape the heat, so it's going to burrow down and end up cooking itself. You want to put your heat source on one of the sides of the tank. So other than that, just get a little bowl or a milk, the lid off a milk bottle, with some wet cotton wool, or tissue, that's its water. It'll just go and sit on that and sink its fangs into it when it wants to have a drink and you just replace that when it needs replacing. When it starts to look a bit slimy and disgusting, you replace it. That's really it. Other than that, you just replace their substrate every month or so. Um, Australian bird eating spiders are not really recommended for handling. I mean, I know in America especially, tarantula keepers keep a lot of various, they have a lot more colourful species there, either native to America or Mexico usually. Those species are much more placid, well not all of them, but a lot of them are, and they're more suited to handling. Australian bedding spiders are quite aggressive, um, and you just don't want to handle these guys. So like, I'll show you this one, because you can't really see it at the moment. There we go. So yeah, that's the Cenolodicus plumipes. Um, it's not fully grown, it'll get a little bigger. And yes, this type of spider. Yes, as you can see, it's quite aggressive. And this is actually my more placid tarantula. Out of all of my tarantulas, this is my more placid one. This is also the one that I always do feeding demonstrations on because it always feeds. The second I put food, it's always out, it never hides. I drop food in front of it, it always grabs the food. 
even now it's actually having more of a food response to the tongs than an aggression response. It's kind of, yeah, it's not even being too aggressive. The others, the other ones actually, they make a hissing noise, these spiders as well. This one's not hissing, so it's actually kind of feeling around with its legs at the moment because it's expecting food. So yeah, it's probably my most plus little one, but I'm still, I still wouldn't recommend even holding this one. So that's the care, that's the basic care for these guys. Pop that away now. Moving on. Now, for all you more advanced insect and spider keepers, and I do stress advanced, centipedes might be an option. Now the reason I say advanced is because one, they're reasonably venomous, um, they're very fast, there's no safe way to pick them up. You cannot put a centipede on your hand or physically grab it. I can physically pick up a birding spider like that, even if it's aggressive, I can pin it with my fingers and pick it up. There's no safe way to grab a centipede without getting bitten. I wouldn't even recommend holding one, they're almost guaranteed to bite you, they're just extremely aggressive. Um, they use their jaws to actually dig, so if it wants to, it'll just be trying to dig into your hand, you end up getting bitten that way, so it's just not recommended, and yeah, they're escape artists as well, so you want to have a tank that's fully sealed. Um, they can't climb glass or jump, but yeah, if there's any gaps they can fit through, they'll try. And they're quite strong. They actually, centipedes have the same muscular strength as a snake of the same size. So they're quite strong. Um, so this one in particular is a giant tiger centipede. Um, I've had this one for a few years now. They do live for quite a long time as well. They'll live about 10 to 15 years, some of them. Um, they do get quite large. This one is about this long. I'll show you in a minute. Um, so with feeding on both on these guys and actually the bird-eating spider, I forgot to mention feeding. Um, you only have to feed them once a week. You can go once a fortnight too if you really want to. Crickets, woodies are fine. I mean the centipede will take a small mouse if I give it to it. But the spider, just crickets and woodies, they're fine. One or two of those every week or two. Um, same substrate as the spider, the coconut fibre, same deal with the moisture and humidity. Um, centipedes are at risk of dehydrating very quickly though. Spiders not as much. I mean, I've found I've lost tarantulas due to either it's too cold or it gets too hot. Centipedes I've lost due to dehydration. The enclosure's dried out. They've had no water for maybe a day or two, which isn't that long for an invertebrate, but they've died. Their water, their body isn't quite as good at retaining water as the spiders and the scorpions. They lose a lot of water when they excrete their waste in comparison, so their body just naturally loses more water. So you always make sure they have moisture. Quite a nice display animal if you get a colourful centipede like a giant tiger. Um, again, smaller enclosure, a bit bigger than the spider's one, but it's still quite small, so it does display quite nicely. Um, I've actually got lots of these at the moment because they were breeding for me this year, so I got all these babies. So any of you customers coming into Auburn Aquariums who want some little tiger centipedes, they're only quite small. I'm selling them for $15 each. If you want one, let me know. Alright, I'll show you this guy. Now, there is a slight chance that he will escape on me because he is tall. He is longer than this tank is tall. And I have my tongs, but they're fast and this is all I've got, so we'll see how this goes. I might just actually grab him with the tongs and hold him because I don't really trust him with the lid off. So this is the giant tiger centipede. Um, I'll put him a little closer, he's getting quite close to my fingers. Those jaws are not the thinnest fangs, they're quite thick fangs, so just them penetrating your skin would be very, very painful. And yes, he's right near my hand, so I'm going to just put those down and swap over. He's coming back this way now. So as you can see, there's no safe way to hold these guys. Um, tongs or nothing. And he's actually biting the tongs with his fangs just so he can grip them. If that was my hand, he'd do the exact same, do the exact same thing, basically. Um, I'm going to put him back now because it's hard to talk when he's walking around. So yes, that was the giant tiger centipede. And as you can see, he's almost as long as these tongs. 
Um, I had a couple of centimeters gap between his head and my fingers when I was swapping ends, so they did get quite large. Okay, moving on. Just make sure he's okay. I don't like handling them like that with tongs, but I wanted to show you guys what they look like. Alright, now we're on scorpions. Now, there's a few species you can choose here. I've got a few species here, there are a lot more to choose from than what I've got here, it's just I don't make the video too long. A very popular choice is a Flinders Range Scorpion. Now this is the largest scorpion species in Australia. They get about that big, about almost 8 to 10 centimeters. The males are what everyone wants in a Flinders Scorpion. It's the female Flinders Scorpion. They're still a nice, it's quite a nice looking scorpion still, but the males have, the females don't. They've got a really long tail. The male's tail is out of proportion to their body, it's very long, and a lot of people like that look, so a lot of people go for male splinters over females. This one in particular is a male. Now these are reasonably okay to handle, they're not really that aggressive, um, and even if I did get stung, they're not that venomous. So that is a Flinders scorpion male there. He's the more aggressive, I have a female, she's got babies at the moment, I'll show you her in a sec. I would have rather hold the female in my video, but she's got babies on her at the moment, so I'm holding the male. But he, he is a little bit quicker and a little more aggressive than the female, so we a good look at that, guys. So you said not that bad, really. I mean, quite easy to handle. At the end of the day, they all have, they all have their own personalities. This one's quite aggressive. I've had others in it. Flinders that are not aggressive, it just depends, really. So the care for these guys, again, small enclosure suits them better. Coconut fibre. The thing that differs between flinders, if you can get a hold of a piece of slate, like that, that's what they like. They love dwelling under bits of slate. Flinders scorpions aren't burrowers, like spiders and even centipedes. They like to live under flat surfaces. So if you have a flat piece of slate, just flat on the bottom of the substrate, slightly angled up, maybe wedge something under it so it's slightly angled up, that's what they like. Other than that, same thing, humidity and moisture, a cricket, once a week or once a fortnight, is all they need. And that's how you pick a scorpion up, just by the tail, just underneath the telson, which is this little bulb here with the stinger on it, and I'm going to put him back before he pinches me, but yeah, that's basically flinders. Now this is the female flinders that I was telling you about. She's got babies, so I'm not going to pick her up. But I will show you to her real quick. So you can see there, she's got babies on her back. Most have jumped off, they're all hiding underneath her still, so they're still she's still looking after them. Um, so I'm going to start separating these babies within the next day or two. Um, at the moment, they're still quite happy being under the mother's care, and they're happy living together. But probably a few more days, they will start venturing off and hunting and looking after themselves and when it gets to that stage I do have to separate them or they may start eating each other or even worse the mother might start eating them so in the next day or two I'm going to separate them. Another one I'm selling these guys will be going for $25 each once they're a little bigger um, so yes any customers of Auburn Cream and you want a Flinders baby let me know. So interesting fact about the Flinders also these are one of the hardest scorpions to breed. One, because the males and females, they're pairing them up. Um, usually they end up killing each other. And two, even if you manage to successfully mate a pair, the female flinders gestates for 18 months, so it's quite a long time to have a scorpion that's pregnant. Um, 18 months, it, something can happen to it in that time, it can end up dying. So it's a long time to wait for a, a scorpion for, you know, for it to potentially have babies. Um, so I got very lucky with this one. Okay, next one. Now these are one of the more common species found in pet shops. This is a desert scorpion. Um, they're another good beginner's one, but they're not very good for handling. Um, deserts are quite aggressive, not venomous, so if you get stung, unless you're allergic to insect stings, it's fine. It's kind of a bee sting is actually worse than a desert scorpion sting. 
Um, but on that note, like I said, if you are one of those people that are allergic to bee stings or insect bites and stings, um, you might want to be just rethink keeping any of these things because if you react badly to a bee sting, you're going to react badly to any of these. So I'll show you the desert. This is only a very small desert. It's still quite young. So yes, that is a little desert scorpion. They do get bigger. This is only a baby. They get about five to six centimeters long. Um, this one's been quite good at the moment. My desert scorpions, for some reason, are not that aggressive. Um, I don't handle them regular or anything like that. I don't even touch them. Because these insects, these guys, at the end of the day, they're kind of display pets. You don't really handle them unless you have to move them. Um, but I think it is possibly down to the enclosures I'm keeping them in. They're just calmer. They're more relaxed. They don't feel so exposed. Um, I only open the enclosure when I'm feeding them, so I guess they associate the lid of the enclosure opening up to them getting food. So, yeah, they don't react so bad to me disturbing them. Um, but generally deserts are quite fast, they're quite twitchy and aggressive. Um, all you have to do is blow on them gently and they'll fire up, wanting to fight basically. So, normally not a scorpion handle. And now I've got to get him off, he's not going to let go now. This guy would only eat one small cricket a week. It's a small but a fully grown desert can eat a large cricket once or twice, once every one to two weeks. You don't have to use coconut fibre for these. I do because it's just less effort as far as moisture goes. It, like I said, it retains moisture really well. Um, but being a desert scorpion, you can use desert sand or just white sand if you like the white sand. They are a burrowing species, so you want to have a thicker substrate. Um, yeah. Not as demanding on the moisture as the other species. They can go in a dry enclosure, provided at least you give them something to drink out of. Just give them a little dish with water or a wet sponge or a wet cotton wool or something like that and make sure that's always moist. They're happy with that. The rest of the enclosure can be dry if you want it to. So if you like the look of desert sand or white sand with a nice rock scape or driftwood even, go for a desert scorpion. But because if you don't like the look of coconut fiber, that'll be the one to go with because most of the other scorpion and spider species, you do have to keep them in coconut fiber. Last one for this video. Other end of the scale from the desert is a rainforest scorpion. Now the rainforest scorpion, they're quite interesting looking. I mean, they've got fairly large claws and a relatively small tail. So you can see the tail there, it's quite tiny. Um, they're okay to handle, they're not really that aggressive, they've got quite a pinch on them, just because of the size of their claws. Um, again, rainforest, so coconut fibre, humidity and moisture, same deal, crickets. Um, that's really it. These guys are a scorpion that will die quite easily if, they dry, if they're in a dry enclosure, so you want to always make sure they have moisture. Driftwood is a good... Um, item to use for escape of some sort in the tank, build a structure with. Uh, being a rainforest species, naturally they're living in trees, under the bark, in the crevices of rotten logs, stuff like that. Um, so rocks aren't really suited to them, they're not going to be happy with rocks. You want bark and driftwood, and or branches and stuff like that. So even like rotten wood, if you can get some driftwood and it's always moist, it's going to go a bit soft. They like that. Um, these guys have a relatively flat body as well. And the reason being for that, these guys in the wild will naturally eat other scorpions. They're not that venomous at all. But they can eat venomous scorpions. And the way they do that, they've got this flat body, they'll wedge themselves right into a tight little crevice that they can just barely fit into. And another type of spider or scorpion walks past. They've got these giant overpowered strong claws. They can grab that other scorpion out through, they can just reach out of their crevice, grab the other scorpion and tear it to bits. The other scorpion can't even fight it back because this scorpion's whole body is in the crevice still. It's inaccessible to them basically. So they just tear it apart and their whole body's protected. Um, so yes, and these are actually a communal species. There's not many. Black rock scorpions are also communal. I don't have one with me now to do a video. don't have enough time for that. But um, black rocks are communal and so are these guys. 
So if you would like to have a group of rainforest scorpions together, you can do so. Just um, make sure they're well fed because they're technically communal and I've had them in groups before. On the odd occasion, one has eaten another. So just make sure that they are well fed and you're quite fine to keep them in a group. There is also a way of measuring how venomous a scorpion is to an extent, um, just by its body structure. And as you saw with the rainforest scorpion, very large claws and a small tail. That means it's not really venomous at all. It doesn't need to be. It's got these giant claws that are so strong and powerful it can just tear its prey apart. It doesn't need venom to kill. When you have other scorpions, like for example, um, I don't have one here to show you, but a spider hunting scorpion, they're basically opposite. They've got really thin, tiny, little, weak looking claws, and they've got this huge, oversized, fat tail. They're the venomous ones. Their claws are so weak, they couldn't overpower anything bigger than them, or the same size as them, like a rainforest can. They need to compensate that. They need to have really fast acting, neuro, you know, strong neurotoxic venom. So a quick sting and it's dead in a couple of minutes, so they don't have to fight it off with these weak claws. All the other scorpions I showed you, like the desert and the flinders, where everything's pretty much in proportion, I mean, they're still not that venomous. Their claws are still big enough to do the job they need to do. They do have venom. It does sting a bit when we get stung. I'm sure it has a much worse effect on a cricket than it does us. Um, but yeah, not that venomous, guys. The main venomous ones are the centipedes and the bird-eating spiders. Bird-eating spider venom, everyone reacts different to it, I've discovered. Some people, I've been bitten by bird-eating spiders and nothing much really happens. I get a little bit, it hurts a lot, it swells up a bit, that's it. Other people who maybe are more allergic get bitten by a bird-eating spider. There's a whole list of symptoms that they can go through. I mean, there's vomiting, there's sweating, there's nausea, there's chills, aches and pains, all sorts of stuff. Um, centipede venom varies depending on the centipede, to be honest. Uh, I couldn't really specify that one. Some centipedes will make you, it's just pretty painful. Some centipedes, it's agonizing pain for hours and hours, and other centipedes, you will need a trip to the hospital. Um, the giant tiger centipede is just very, very painful, and if you do react bad to insect bites, then yes, you might have to go to the hospital. So, always be wary when handling these animals. Tongs are something you will always need when keeping invertebrates. This is really the only tool you need for these guys. I mean, scorpions, when you get used to handling them, you don't need tongs. Um, I don't recommend tongs for picking up spiders. Bird-eating spiders, spiders, the tarantulas have got a very soft body. Their body is actually quite soft and delicate. And their body is full of fluid. If I was to pick him up these tongs and I squeeze a little too hard and I puncture him, he's going to bleed out and die. They're full of liquid. The tarantula cuts itself, it does bleed out and die sometimes. So you don't want to even pick them up with tongs. Tongs are good for the centipedes, their body is very durable. Um, and scorpions, not too bad, but you can use your hands if you're used to holding them. So that's it guys, that's basically all the basic care for invertebrates. Thanks for watching guys.